back right now? Well, you know, other than some animal spirits that seem to believe that there's a magic potion out there, um, with $20 trillion of printed money by the central banks or thereabouts, uh, we're still moving along at a snail's pace, about 2%, give or take a little bit, one way or another. Um, you know, this year, if, if we stay on a current trajectory, we'll do about 2% again. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that they could change the dynamic. Now, just think about the fact if they take their foot off the gas pedal, what happens? You know, we can't get better than 2% with $20 trillion worth of money at zero rates around the world. This year alone, central banks have added about $2 trillion worth of assets outside of the Fed, and we're still just bumping along. So I, I expect that at some point we're going to run out of gas and we're going to reverse and go even lower. A lot of people are looking at the stock market and, you know, they're continually seeing it move up higher and higher each time. And, you know, it bobs up and down. And there's a lot of financial institutions out there like Bank of America. I believe UBS also came out and said that there's going to be some type of market correction. And I'm starting to see a lot of financial institutions come out and say this um, from what you've been looking at in your research. Uh, why do you think they're out there telling everyone that there's going to be some type of market correction? Well, I, I think if nothing else, they're hedging that bet. You know, in my long history of being in the investment world, if you were an investment strategist or you were a research analyst and you had a negative view of the world and you were wrong for any period of time, it was a career risk. You lost your job. Uh, you became unbelievable. So, Oh, every every investment firm out there is generally bullish all the time, every day. And we've just basically had a straight up run. Now, you know, markets don't act like this, but we have people starting to go into the FOMO mode, F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. So everybody wants to join this bandwagon because it seems like there's money in the street. And it's easy picking, so let's go. And I think it's prudent for the Bank of America or whomever to put out cautionary advice. You know, maybe you should just back off a little bit. But if you just watch like the CNBC every day, you have people out there buying large day in and day out saying the market's going higher. So it can go higher. John, you know, John Maynard Keynes said the market could stay irrational longer than you could stay solvent. Now, do you think that the market really makes any sense that the market should be this high right now? Well, in, in theory, anyway, the market is supposed to project future results of companies. Um, I would think that everything for the next several years is already baked in the price. But some people seem to think that, you know, things grow to the sky. For example, since about 2014, corporate earnings are up about 3% or thereabouts, and the market's up 30%. So I would say the market's already priced in any growth in earnings that we have or are going to have for the next several years. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't go higher. It's certainly in the realm of possibility. Now, last time you were on, we talked about pensions and you told us that there are pension problems headed our way. And since that time, which is very interesting, a Senator Brown, a Democrat from Ohio, is planning to introduce legislation that would allow struggling multi-employer pension funds to borrow from the U.S. Treasury to remain solvent. And to me, that sounds like we're headed down a path of uh, pension problems. Is that what it sounds like to you? And, and why do you think they're pushing this type of legislation? Well, you know, Sherrod Brown is a relatively liberal Democrat, uh, you know, uh, union kind of backer. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily. But pensions have problems because they were never funded properly. And the idea that somebody could retire and get paid their full compensation for 20 or 30 years 
is a ludicrous con concept. Um, so therefore, now that you have an aging population and they have all these crazy schemes built in that, you know, we're going to pay you for the next 20 or 25 years at your full salary, there's just no pension in the world that can do that. So now they're starting to see, you know, major states, Illinois, New Jersey, Kentucky, and, and others, Rhode Island, that have pension issues of underfunded liabilities. And they know that they're going to either the pensioners are going to wake up one day and get an email or a phone call or whatever saying, by the way, you were supposed to get a hundred bucks, but unfortunately we don't have enough money. So you're going to get 50 bucks or 60 bucks or 40 bucks or whatever the number is. I can't tell you what that number is, but it's not going to be a hundred. So this is, this is his way of saying to the pensioners out there, don't worry, we have your back. But with $20 trillion in debt already in the United States, how much further do they think that the world is going to keep funding these ridiculous deficits without any price to be paid? So that, that's what I think he's trying to do. But I think it's, you know, and if they ever, approve something like this, then we become Zimbabwe. Let's go on the track where it's not approved. How bad is the pension crisis going to be? Well, like I said, I mean, I think that every pension fund in the world that gives out these ridiculous benefits, and I'll give you an example. Years ago, <coughs> excuse me, I was uh, talking to the head of the Senate Finance Committee in a state um, that we were monitoring, uh, we were actually the consultant on the pension account. And he said to me, we're underfunded and, um, you know, what can we do to get rid of this underfunding? So I said to him, you could do two things. You could cut benefits. He says, politically not viable. I said, you could raise taxes to pay for it. Politically not viable. I said, that's your answer. There is no way that we can pay these schemes, or I call them Ponzi schemes, because it was very easy for people running for a public office to say, you know, we're going to raise the pension funds and give you more pension funds. Look, Roger Smith, who ran General Motors back in the 70s, was probably the first one that I, I knew of that traded pension, future pension benefit for current cash raises. Well, we know what happened to General Motors in 2007. They went bankrupt because of the pension fund. And that's what's going to happen to all of these other things. You know, Puerto Rico, unfortunately, had this hurricane, terrible uh, disaster in, in Puerto Rico. But the pension problems in Puerto Rico and the bond problems in Puerto Rico didn't go away. You know, either they're going to take less than 100 cents on a dollar, which I think they have to take. I don't know what the right number is. Is it, you know, 50 cents, 60 cents, 40 cents? I don't know. But that's what's going to happen to all of these states. Now, the question is when. I think it's going to happen within the next 10 years. It may happen sooner, but I think within the next 10 years, we're going to run out of money. When this does happen, do you think the people are just going to sit back and just say, oh, big deal, it's not a problem? Or do you see people, you know, getting angry? Well, you know, if you just look at the anger in the country right now about, you know, broken promises by the political class on both sides of the aisle over the last 20 or 30 years, um, people are getting angrier and angrier. You know, some think that, you know, we'll wrap ourselves in the flag on the right side. Other people are going to take to the streets. But historically, every time we've had these kinds of crises, People come, go to the streets and we have some sort of revolution. Um, I don't, I, I, I think that it's coming. I can't tell you when, Dave, but I think it's coming. 
Okay, let's move on to um, the precious metals market because the last week or so, we've seen a lot of paper gold contracts slam down. Um, we've seen another one, and it usually happens around 9.30 in the morning uh, where they slam gold down and you know they, they keep the price the same. Uh, why do you think they're not allowing gold to move any higher? And do you think this is the true price of gold right now? No, as a matter of fact, I don't. I mean, anytime you start to see repeated kinds of trades in the market, it's generally somebody, some central bank, or some big uh, uh, trading house or hedge fund or whatever, trying to disrupt the marketplace. Uh, and that's what I think is happening. You know, if you look around the world, you know, the Chinese central banks adding gold reserves, the Russian central bank adding gold reserves. So they want to have a currency system, a payment system, whatever you want to call it, that is based on real money. Gold has been around for thousands of years and has always had value. Paper money is a relatively new phenomenon. But as we go back in history, we know that every major empire in the world, whether it was Greece, Rome, Egyptians, etc., they always debased the currency. Well, I think we're debasing the currency now here. We're printing money that's backed by the full faith and credit of the government. What does that mean? Um, so at the end of the day, it's as long as somebody's willing to accept your paper, uh, then it has value. I mean, you know, we had Zimbabwe recently, uh, last couple of years anyway, they printed a, a bill that it said $1 trillion. It was worth about one cent. So, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, we could, this can keep going on. I think that eventually gold has to break out to the upside because it's one of the only stores of value out there that has a history going back thousands of years. Now, the BRIC countries, which is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, they are looking at the possibility of creating a unified system of gold trade and looking to maybe, you know, reevaluate gold. Um, because what they're saying is the traditional system based in London and uh, partially in Swiss cities is becoming less relevant. Do you see uh, them taking their gold hoard that they've been accumulating and saying, okay, we've purchased it for $1,100, $1,200 an ounce, and now we're going to reevaluate and, you know, put a different price on gold? Well, I think that, you know, hopefully what I will hope what they will do is, you know, create a market where gold trades freely and has a real price. Um, you know, recently we talked about, I think, I, I'm not sure if I, I talked about it on your show last time, but if China decides to ultimately get the price of oil in yuan, now maybe people don't want yuan, but they were talking about a system whereby, you know, they'll trade in yuan, but if you don't want yuan, they'll give you gold. That seems to be a system that makes a lot of sense to me and would make a lot of sense to a seller because then they can get something they know has a certain amount of value. I believe that there is already a gold price quoted in Shanghai on a daily basis. So I think we're moving in that direction. Um, I just don't, you know, when it ultimately takes hold, I can't tell you. But clearly, you know, China doesn't want to be... Uh, uh, covered by the U.S. dollar and based on whatever the Federal Reserve or the administration, the current administration, the future administration decide to do regarding the currency, they don't want to have to deal with that. They have no control of that. They would rather have something that they can have some control over. And if they trade oil in dollars, um, uh, trade oil in yuan, rather, they have a lot more control. Now, clearly, the Saudis have been holding, have not announced that they're willing to accept yuan, 
But I think they'll move in that direction as well. Let me just back up here for a second. If the Saudis decide that, okay, we're no longer, because really they're like the hub and they're like, they're like the centralized system for the petrodollar. If they move towards the petro yuan, I mean, what happens to the dollar then? Well, in my opinion, the dollar crashes. Um, and, uh, you know, and then all hell breaks loose in all markets around the world. Um, you know, clearly, if you look at the major oil producers in the world today, you have Russia and Saudi Arabia, one, two, depending on each month. I mean, they're close relatively in their production. Russia doesn't want to deal in dollars. Another large producer of oil is Iran. They don't want to deal in dollars. I think Iran has a tremendous amount of sway in Iraq. So they're another very large producer of oil. They don't necessarily want to trade in dollars. Venezuela, another producer of oil, I'm sure they don't want to trade in dollars since we, you know, treated them with sanctions, etc. So I would believe that, you know, if Saudi cracks and says we will accept you won for oil, then I think the whole dollar system starts to fall apart. And that may bring about a war. I don't know, but certainly possible. Now, if the dollar system breaks apart, and I, I just want to clear, you know, make this clear to everyone who's listening, what happens here? Because, you know, people are going about their everyday lives. They're out there spending, you know, the dollar. They think everything's going to be fine. And there, you know, many people are not even thinking of this. If this does happen the way we're, we're talking about it, I mean, what are the people going to feel? I mean, what are they going to experience when this happens? Well, the day it happens, they won't feel anything. Tomorrow, if they go out and buy something that was made in China, they may have to pay, you know, 30% more, 40% more, 50% more, maybe 100% more. Who knows? I mean, inflation will come back rampantly in this country, and we will be, you know, having this real problem of potentially hyperinflation to deal with because if, if the dollar goes down by 25 percent and you are you know china or europe or whomever selling goods to the united states you're no longer going to say well i'm going to accept the dollar i really want a dollar and a quarter or a dollar and a half or a dollar and three quarters etc so i think inflation comes back it will affect everybody in a very negative way. And we will no longer be able to live beyond our means. I mean, last year we had a budget deficit of about $700 billion or thereabouts. And now, according to the Con Congressional Budget Office, it looks like the, tra the trajectory of deficits is going towards a trillion again. Um, we won't be able to finance our debt. You know, people will say you have to live within your means, um, which is going to be a shock to this country because we just can't keep spending and spending and spending and cutting taxes and cutting taxes. You know, sooner or later, the, the other people that have to buy our treasuries to fund this debt will just say, no mas, I'm done. Well, can't the Federal Reserve just step in and, and you know, try to control the situation? Um I, I guess they can. I mean, I'm not sure what they could do about it. I mean, they could. They tried this experiment with QE, which is basically printing money. And if you go back through history, any country that ultimately printed money as a way of escaping, you know, fiscal restraint, wound up with hyperinflation. You know, look at Venezuela. You know, 20 years ago it was a a nice country. They had. You know, a lot of oil revenue. They were people lived pretty well. Now you go into a, a store to buy some chicken, let's say, and you come in with paper and they put it on a scale. They don't count it. They weigh it. And, you know, clearly we don't want to go in that direction. And hopefully we'll never, never be in that direction. But it could happen. You know, when things start getting out of control, it's very, very hard to stop it. So uh, I don't think the Federal Reserve, unless they, you know, did a coordination with the rest of the world, but I'm not sure that all the central banks 
would would you know side with us. I think it would be, you know, going back to the original comment, it'll be chaos. For those people who are thinking this, just like I am, what do you do to protect yourself against the coming inflation? Should you hold more dollars? Should you purchase land? I mean, land. I mean, what? I mean, your in your opinion, what would you do? Well, look, I I I think that you know, for the average person, I'm not sure re- really what you can do. You could own more gold or more precious metals because I think that they will be very valuable in that chaotic environment. Uh, buying land, uh, you know, if, if you're going to use land to farm and produce food, yeah, maybe that makes some sense. But to buy land, I mean, who are you going to sell it to? So, you know, I, uh, I, I think that it will be very, very, very difficult times for us if that unfolds the way it's currently heading. Um, I think that you know, unless we start acting with restraint on our fiscal house in the United States and not saying everybody can have two, you know, two chickens in every pot and two cars in every garage and every household, uh, we have to start living within our means. Um, I hope it's not too late. So, I mean, during this whole period of time where we, uh, that, that we've been talking about where um, you know, if something happens, we, you know, we could see inflation if the dollar is no longer used for oil and the petro yuan comes into play. The ECB and the Fed, they really haven't been doing much in the last couple of months. Uh, the ECB, I think, is going to keep uh, what they've been doing through 2018. They're not going to really change it up that much. The Fed, they're saying that they're going to be unwinding. I don't believe it's begun yet. They haven't really changed the interest rates. Uh, is there anything they can do? I mean, are, are they going to raise the interest rates? Are they going to actually unwind? What are they planning to do at this point? Because right now, everything is just you know staying pretty much the same. Well, I think the Fed has painted themselves in a corner. Um, you know, I think that uh, they they decided, or Ben Bernanke decided in 2010, to save the banking system, which I think was probably a pretty good idea, because if you know if, you, if people went to an ATM machine and you couldn't get your own money out, that would be like revolutionary. So they saved the banking system by doing this QE, and they were hoping that the fiscal side would start to kick in and the economy would start to grow again, and we would slowly work our way out of it. But instead, every time they took their foot off the gas, the economy started to decelerate again. So they went to QE2 and then QE3 and Operation Twist, etc. Well, now, again, the Federal Reserve has about $4.5 trillion on their balance sheet. And they, start, they, they stopped uh, adding new bonds a few years ago. However, they still reinvest all bonds that have matured, and so they kept the, the balance sheet at the same level. Now they're actually talking about reducing the balance sheet. But what they're actually, what the, they, I think they, they cut the balance sheet by $6 billion last month or thereabouts. And I think what they're doing, instead of buying $30 billion a month of bonds that mature, they'll buy $24 billion. And hopefully the market will pick up the other six billion. And if that works for a couple of months, then they're going to go to ten billion a month, and then twenty billion a month, and then fifty billion a month, etc., until they wind down the balance sheet. Clearly, they understand that if there's another major financial crisis, they don't have a lot of bullets in their gun. I mean, interest rates are pretty close to zero. They have four and a half trillion dollars on their balance sheet. I mean, again, you know, it becomes the perception at what point do people say, you know, you can't keep printing money. It just doesn't make any sense anymore. So um, I, I think that the, the ECB is probably in the same boat that the Fed is in. They're buying every bond that's issued by sovereign governments in Europe now. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think they're hopeful that they could unwind in a very slow, methodical way without causing the bond markets to erupt. Now, that you, people got to keep their fingers crossed. 
They were also raising rates very slowly so they could put some more bullets back in the gun in case, you know, the economy starts to go south again, which I think it's going to happen, that uh, they're going to be able to lower rates. You know, remember, in Europe, most of the governments still have negative interest rates, which is sort of a ludicrous idea that you're going to buy a bond for a dollar and get back 98 cents and think that that's a good idea. I mean, that sounds like it's nuts to me, but, you know, who am I to say? So do you think that they'll be able to do this before the next crisis hits? Because it looks like they're moving at a very, very slow pace. If they have four and a half trillion, I mean, getting rid of a couple billion, you know, over a period of time, this is a, you know, it's going to take forever. That's that's exactly right. Um, You know, they're hopeful that if they're successful at the lower rates, they'll be able to raise it eventually to 50 billion a month. But even at 50 billion a month, you're talking about 600 billion a year. Divide that into four and a half trillion, and you're out about eight or nine years. So we're talking about a very, very long time to get the balance sheet back into some sort of normalcy. And I have to guess, under normal economic circumstances, we're going to have some sort of uh, recession or slowdown or whatever uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, Maybe not this year or maybe not next year, although it's certainly possible that things are slowing down. I mean, you know, we had a 3% print on GDP in the third quarter. And if you take out an inventory adjustment and a few other things, the actual growth was about 1.9, back to the 2% number. So, um, you know, they are praying, I think, that, you know, I think, you know, they're in the land of hopium and upsidasium that, you know, they'll be able to pull this off. I'm I'm hopeful that they can pull it off also, because the last thing I need in my life at this stage is chaos. But unfortunately, that's what more than likely will happen. And what do you think is going to happen to the banks? I know they propped them up and they had stress tests. Um, a lot of the European banks, uh, they're saying that a lot of them are insolvent. Actually, they're saying it here in the United States, too. Uh, do you think the banks are going to have a problem when everything starts to go, you know, south? Well, you know, I think that, you know, in, in some degree, what some of these regulations have done in this, in this country, they've prohibited banks from trading for their own account, which is one of the reasons why we had the crisis in 2008. Um, the banks in the United States, by and large, except the big banks, are you know probably fairly well capitalized at this point. Europe still has a lot of bad loans on their books, and they're trying to unwind those bad loans little by little uh, as they can, and you know trying to get some of those banks you know solvent again. Um, but it's a slow process. You know, if we go back to the 1920s. When we had the Great Depression, if we didn't have the war, we would probably take another 15 or 20 years to get out of the Depression. These kinds of financial crises take a very, very long time to unwind. You know, there are no easy solutions. There are no bad solutions, uh, good solutions, rather. They just slow as you slowly rebuild confidence. And you slowly build consumer confidence and people start acting normally again, stop hoarding, etc. cetera. So um, this is a long term process. And we're still in the, in the early innings of that process, in my opinion. You know, given the fact that eight years in, they're still buying bonds, the ECB and JOB bought about two trillion dollars this month. That doesn't look like escape velocity to me. So. Uh, you know, I'm I'm hopeful. You know, I guess I have to have hope, otherwise they put a gun to my head. But um, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I think that they have a, a monumental task, and I think they know it. Do you? I mean, you mentioned war, and you mentioned uh, you know this is what happened during the Great Depression, where you know we went into war. Do you think this is why there we hear a lot of war talk going on right now? to distract us from what it really is coming? Um, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't speak to that specifically, but I could tell you one thing. If you go back through history, most 
wars were caused because of economic hard times. Um, and, and, you know, we are heading into that position again. You know, the United States is, 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 you know, sparring with China as to who is going to be the dominant economy in the world at some point. Uh, I think it will be China. And we're not going to give up that throne so easily. So, you know, is there a war coming? It certainly seems that way. The Middle East is a powder keg. China and India don't really like each other. That's another potential powder keg. Us and China, another powder keg. Now, I mean, just think that, you know, we have these. I just read recently that Iran was sending a fleet of ships, you know, up towards the Atlantic Ocean and towards the Gulf of Mexico. I wonder what the reaction in Washington is going to be if Iranian ships are, you know, 300 miles off our coast. I mean, I mean, you know, we live in very tenuous times, in my opinion. So, you know, and all you have to do is make one bad decision. I mean, go, going back, I remember when I was in college and we were talking about World War II. And I had a professor at the time that said that when Japan decided to bomb Pearl Harbor, which I think we caused by, by embargoing the oil in, to Japan, they could have just as easily gone to San Francisco. It was about the same distance from the fleet, but they felt that they wouldn't, that the United States wouldn't react as badly if we went to Pearl Harbor. Now, you know, now you got this crazy guy in North Korea, and who knows what he might do? You know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're on a powder keg, Dave, and, uh, you know, war could come at any time. But look at us. 15 years we've been fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have our troops that are really sort of worn out, in my opinion. Keep, and so this is, not, this is not a good time. And then if you see the stock market making new highs at, with this backdrop, you sort of have to scratch your head. Phil, for my last question, I just want to go back to something that you said with China, where, you know, the U.S. and China are fighting to see who's going to be the economic power. And if it does shift to China, and we talked about, you know, our way of life, that it's going to, you know, have to change because of the, the crash and collapse. If the economic power moves to China, what happens to our way of life at that point? Well, I think that we will have to cut back on our way, you know, our standard of living. Um, you know, I, we won't be able to live beyond our means until the world readjusts, I guess, if, you know, the last country that had the economic power in the world was Great Britain, um, and they adjusted, and they live sort of normal lives now. Um, so I don't know what will happen, you know, immediately, but I have to think that our standard of living will go down um, until we adjust. Yeah. Dave, one thing before you, before you go. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when people talk about a bubble, I, I, I read this the other day and I thought it was important for your listeners to hear. What makes a bubble? Well, a painting just sold for $450 million that may not be real. Bitcoin, which may or may not be worthless, we can argue that at another point, is up almost 800% this year, when the best year in the stock market is up 82%. And if we have an electricity crisis, how are you going to get your Bitcoin? Bank of Japan and European Central Bank bought $2 trillion of assets. Global debt rose by over $225 trillion to 324% of GDP. U.S. corporations sold $1.8 trillion in bonds this year. European junk bonds yielded under 2%. Argentina, a serial defaulter, Sold 100-year bonds, which was oversubscribed. Illinois, hopefully, hopefully insolvent, sold 3.75 bonds to bondholders, fighting for an allocation. Stock market valuation skyrocketed 15 trillion to 113 percent of GDP. The market cap of fangs increased by more than a trillion. If that's not a bubble, I have no idea what the definition of a bubble is.